Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome as we gather for worship, if virtually, uh, but we come to worship God in spirit and in truth, and we seek God's truth for us in his word. Today we are looking at two passages. First, from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, reading verses 1 through 4 and verses 7 through 9, a familiar passage that reads this way. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or your female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. The New Testament lesson is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, reading verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent uh, his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls." When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, let now the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today's Old Testament passage is the beginning of and the first part of the Ten Commandments. And so I'm going to focus on the Ten Commandments for the sermon. So right at the beginning, let's do a little pop quiz. The Ten Commandments. How many are there? Well, trick question, right? Maybe that's too easy. But the Ten Commandments are a complicated part of our Bible. They appear here. In Exodus 20, they appear again in Deuteronomy 5. And though they're well known to us, and we know there are 10 of them, they're quite complicated. A number of years ago, there was a survey asking people, how many of the commandments do you know? Can you recite? And the average number people could recite was only two. So think about that for a moment. How many commandments can you cite? Well, these questions are important, but maybe the more important question is, why do we still read and think about the Ten Commandments? Why are they important to us? After all, many of the laws in the Old Testament may seem obsolete. They seem, perhaps to us as Christians, things that we have moved beyond that are not that important to us. Some of them are surely obscure laws that we no longer take that seriously. 
We have some laws today that are still like that, you know, laws that are on our books still, still illegal to break them, but we wonder why we're there. I, I found one such law from North Carolina that it's illegal in North Carolina, apparently, to play bingo for more than five hours. I don't know why a law like that would still be on the books. Maybe it has something to do with the typical people who play bingo. Maybe five hours is really pushing it for them. Also in Connecticut, there's a law that says you can't wear stilts on a construction site. Have to use scaffolding. Not sure why that law is necessary. We may think of the Ten Commandments along with the other laws of the Old Testament in a similar way. After all, we learn in the New Testament that we are not saved by works of the law. We're saved by grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because of his death, which was a gift to us. We receive God's grace and we know God's salvation, not because we've been obedient to the Ten Commandments or any other laws. So Paul said, that one purpose of the Ten Commandments is simply to point out for us our sinfulness, to help us recognize how bad we are that has led God to send Jesus Christ to die for us. And we can sort of see how that's true, can't we? I mean, just look at the Ten Commandments themselves. They remind us of this. Think about the very last commandment. Do not covet. Don't desire anything that belongs to your neighbor, no matter what it is. When you start really thinking about that law, you realize how often we break it, how impossible it is to really live up to it, and we can kind of see what Paul is talking about. Now, some of the Ten Commandments we may think we can really obey. Do not kill, do not steal. Maybe day to day we do obey those, but when we start looking closely at them, and how they're connected to so many deeper ideas in Scripture, we find that we have trouble really abiding by the spirit of those laws as well. So the Ten Commandments really do this for us. They point out to us our own shortcomings, and that's what Paul said the purpose of the law is. I don't know about you, but I don't, while I see that, I don't really want to spend much time reading and studying the Ten Commandments just to hear them say a big no to me and to you. There must be something else. A second thing that we see the Ten Commandments being for is that they have actually inspired the, the laws that shape the world we live in. And in that way, they've been, been very positive. The Ten Commandments form a, a kind of foundation for many of our laws. And, um, and that's a good thing. But when you think about that, think about the nature of the laws we live by in this country, the laws kind of present to us a minimal standard. And that's what is proven in court. Has this person, um, has this person violated this minimal standard of conduct and expectations? And it's a very low bar and it's very easy to show that, no, the person hasn't quite done that, or there's some doubt about it. Uh, so the laws have influenced, uh, the Ten Commandments have influenced our laws, but in Scripture we learn that we're not after a minimal standard of behavior. Jesus Christ calls us to a life that is so much higher and bigger than that, that we can't ask, how little should I do? To be obedient to God. The question is always, how much more can I do? How much can I give of myself in order to follow Jesus Christ? So Jesus points us in that direction of the maximal commitment, not the minimal. So that's a very limited use to us as Christians. Well, John Calvin the father of Presbyterianism and of our religious tradition that most of us worship in, has given us a third possibility for the commandments. And it's one that we hold dear, at least in the Presbyterian church. He says the commandments are for us opportunities 
to express our gratitude for God's grace. Recognizing that we don't win our way into favor with God, nevertheless, because we experience God's favor, know God's grace, we learn to respond to it in gratitude, and the commandments give us some structure for doing that. By following the Ten Commandments, by writing them on our heart, they become gospel to us because they are about our relationship with God, not about do's and don'ts, right and wrong, in the abstract. They're about how we relate to God in response to what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus died for us and God raised Jesus from the dead, and we're reconciled with him, we respond with thanksgiving and with obedience. Now, the beginning of the Ten Commandments sort of tells us this. We read it this morning. The commandments don't begin with the rules or laws themselves, but with a reminder of who gives the law to us. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. These are the words, of course, to the Israelites who've just been rescued from slavery. They're fresh off their enslavement to Pharaoh, they're out in the wilderness, free for the first time. And now, in response to the freedom God has given them, the Ten Commandments come. And they begin with God identifying himself as the one who has indeed freed them. Same message applies to us. The one who gives us the Ten Commandments is the one who has freed us from the oppression of sin. And the first of the commandments calls us to pay attention to that to be careful that our relationship with God is our first, most important commitment. The first commandment says it plainly. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, these words sound simple, but they place a demand on us that none of us can ever fully live up to. Have no other gods except God. Now, the Old Testament is clear that there is one God who made heaven and earth, one God who rules over it all, and that's easy enough to believe. But the Israelites always recognized that there were other deities out there that the Israelites could go after and that they sometimes found attractive. We may not think in the same way about there being other deities, other gods, but there are certainly other things that we're tempted to commit ourselves to. Martin Luther explained it this way, whatever your heart clings to and relies upon, that is properly your God. Or as the 20th century theologian Paul Tillich said, whatever is your ultimate concern is your God, and that which you put your life in, in that which you put your, put first in your life is properly your God. You start thinking about it that way, it becomes much more difficult, doesn't it? We sometimes have trouble recognizing all the things that we put first in our lives and how dangerous that can be for our relationship with God because some of the things that we commit ourselves to are actually quite good. Our commitment to our family, to our country, to our community, to our church, these are all good things. The question, though, is do these commitments diminish, reduce, or alter our commitment to God? For if our commitment to God is really first, then it will change the decisions we make in every other commitment. The first, com first commandment insists it can't be the other way around. God demands first place. Will Williman, in his experience with students at Duke University, has often talked about how students sometimes come to this, uh, to this calling upon their lives and become very serious about it, and how sometimes others, particularly their parents, don't quite understand. He regularly says that he gets phone calls from uh, angry parents, and the conversation often goes something like this. What have you done to my son? 
What do you mean, what have I done to your son? He tells me he's dropping out of medical school to join the Peace Corps. He just keeps blabbering on about how he's going to commit his life to serving God. Or the parent says, My daughter was supposed to finish an MBA and get a job on Wall Street, but now she's talking about going to be a missionary on an Indian reservation. Williman reports these conversations and often the parent follows this complaint by saying something like, now I think being religious is a good thing as long as it's kept in moderation. I mean, a person has to keep these things in perspective. Well, the point is the first commandment says the first ultimate commitment is to God. That has to control everything else in your life. It doesn't necessarily mean then that you give up dreams of doing other things, but it shapes the way you do everything. The commitment to God is first above everything else. This kind of reminds me of that great quote by Martin Luther King Jr. You know, when he, he talked about what it means to be an extremist. This is language that is often rejected today. Don't be extreme about anything. And King said, you almost can't help it. The question is not, are you going to be an extremist? Well, what kind of extremist are you going to be? He says, will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we, will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? And then he goes on to put it all in perspective by saying, in that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget, King said, that they were crucified, all three of them, for being extremist. Two of them were extremist for immorality, and they were led down into their environment. But one, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and therefore rose above his environment. The first commandment calls us to be extremist for God to claim him as the only thing that guides our lives, and then to let everything else fall in place after that. When we think about it this way, we realize that the first commandment gives us work to do that's going to last a lifetime, because this is summed up in what Jesus called the greatest commandment. It appears in Deuteronomy 6, just after Deuteronomy's account of the Ten Commandments, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Love God with all your being. Well, the second commandment that we've read this morning is just as hard as the first. Do not make for yourself an idol. Now, I know at first that may sound easy, because I'm pretty sure that, I, I'm positive, none of you have little statues sitting around on your coffee table or in the corner somewhere that you go over and bow down to and pray to. Uh, that seems kind of silly, doesn't it, to, do, to think about that. The point of this commandment, however, is not so much that we make a representation of God, although ancient people and the Israelites were tempted to do this. The warning is against not worshiping other gods or worshiping an object, but making an object that represents the God we have who rescued us from our sinfulness, the God who brought the Israelites out of slavery. And the problem with this is that making an, an image of our God is to reduce God down to size. We see a story about this a little later in Exodus in chapter 32. The Israelites, they're waiting for Moses to come and deliver the commandments to them give them a word from the Lord, have become kind of anxious about what's going on with Moses, and they don't know what's happening with this God of theirs, and so they prod Aaron to make for them a golden calf. And when they make the image, they say, what? This is the God who brought us out of the land of Egypt. This is not another God we're introducing, but this is the God who has rescued us. You see what the Israelites are doing? They want a God they can carry around, they can control, 
They want a God they can say begins here and ends here. And that's the temptation for us. It's the temptation to make God smaller than God really is. To, with our descriptions of God or our conceptions of God, to think that we understand exactly what God is and who and what God does and what God expects of us instead of listening for God's voice looking in scripture to hear the radical call to obedience and to service that he gives us. The second commandment is about worshiping false gods in that we want to change the nature of the God who has rescued us in Jesus Christ. But the Ten Commandments make it clear to us God will have nothing of it because he says, I am a jealous God. The word jealous is not one that we like too much. We associate it usually with bad qualities. It's not something that we usually admire. But to say that God is jealous simply means that this one wants to lead us, wants to set our priorities, and wants to show us the truth. He wants to be first in our lives. He will not fit some mold that we create of him. No, we have to pay attention to who he is and listen for where he wants to lead us. As biblical scholars have pointed out, maybe a better translation of this word is zealous. God is zealous for us. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to be there every minute of every day, guiding what we do and think, the commitments we make, everything. And so Martin Luther said, if you really want to obey this first and second commandment and respond to the God who is zealous for you, then what you must do is to be zealous for God. When you think about it that way, you realize that what the commandments are about and what this beginning of the commandments is calling us to do is to ask how much can we commit to God who has loved us in Jesus Christ? What does it demand of us? It demands all our priorities to be changed. Now, for some of us, this means changing the whole direction in life. Um, thinking about Eric Nolan, who when he was finishing college was wondering what he was gonna do with his life and praying about it, taking this very seriously, recognized that he had to answer the call of God upon his life to do ministry. And so it meant for him moving all the way across the country to go to seminary, making all kinds of sacrifices, leaving family, leaving his church, leaving his community. Boy, for some of us, that's what this commitment calls us to do. But for others of us, it simply means that our day-to-day -day choices take on a different tone, that we don't think about ourselves and how we will enrich ourselves so much as we think about how we will respond to God's work in Jesus Christ in our lives. It may mean that you spend your days thinking about someone who you know is lonely and you pick up the phone and call them just to give them a word of encouragement. I know that some of you do this already, and this is just part of what you regularly do and how you think, because you're responding to God's claim on your life and caring for that other person. Maybe you look across the street and you see a child who's going to school. You know the child's struggling, maybe struggling to learn to read, and you go and you dig out a book from your childhood and you take it across and give it to them as a gift and say, hey, school is tough, but I know you can do it, and I've struggled with it too. Here's something I want you to have and know that I believe in you. Maybe it leads you to bake a loaf of bread and take to a new neighbor just to give them a word of welcome and to show them hospitality, and you do that in the name of Jesus Christ. All these are things that many of you are doing already, and you're doing them because 
Jesus Christ has a claim on your life and you're trying to respond to God's love for you, God's rescuing you from your own sinful self by being zealous for God, by responding in gratitude. Have no other gods before me. The biggest challenge we will ever try to live into. It's wonderful to see how many of you are living into it. It's inspiring. But it also reminds us that we all have work to do, don't we? Each and every day to live up to the expectations of this God who has rescued us and now calls us to follow him. Amen. Let us pray together. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, we pray that you would have compassion on all who do not know you as you were revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let the gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have never heard it. We pray that you would turn the hearts of those who resist toward you, that you would bring them home to your fold, those sheep that have gone astray, that they might come and be under one shepherd in one flock, led by Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh God, we give thanks that we are part of this flock, but we also go astray, and we give you thanks for welcoming us back. We ask that you would give us strength to commit ourselves to you. We pray that you would lead us as we struggle to lead a holy life, a life of obedience in response to your grace. We ask that you would use each of us as your instruments, and that together, as your church, we might be your body in the world, showing what it means to love and to forgive and to lead toward peace. May we all be instruments of your peace this day and in the days to come. We pray, O oh God, for the needs of our world and for the many people in our community who need you. There are many who are sick and those who are struggling with loneliness, with depression, with grief, we lift up in silence to you now the names of those who are on our hearts. We pray also, O oh God, for our community, for our nation, and for our world. We especially ask this day that you would be with our president and First Lady, and all those who have been infected with COVID-19, we pray for their recovery. And we pray also that as our election goes forward in the next month, that you would guide us through it in peace, that you would show us the way to post-election, whatever the results, that we as the people of the United States might work together to be a light to the nations, that we might embody all that is good in us because we know that so much of it has been inspired by your word and your vision for the world. We pray that this might be true among us, each of us in the days to come. In the name of Christ, we pray all these things, amen. Well, now, would you go from this place to wherever you are and wherever you're going to be the people of God? And as you do, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.